Any automotive race lasting more than six hours qualifies as an endurance race. Races like the 12 hours of Sebring and 24 hours of Le Mans are considered some of the most challenging endurance races in the world. It takes massive factory efforts with specially built cars and highly experienced drivers to compete in the top classes. The 24 hours of lemons, on the other hand, requires none of those things. So you're going to drive around the paddock very slowly, and you're going to use this to apologize to all the other drivers for being a menace on the racetrack. I apologize for my family-like action, endangering the lives of everyone here. To compete in the cheapest series in the U.S., teams will only need $500 and copious amounts of luck. While Lemons is technically real racing, requiring roll cages, six-point harnesses, and Nomex fire suits, it's not the type of racing where skill, strategy, and a hefty bankroll have much to do with success. Because teams are limited to spending $500 on their vehicles, they tend to be cars that already have three wheels in the scrapyard. Lemons racing is a second life for these used up or abandoned crap cans, and it's almost guaranteed that their new life will end in a spectacularly horrible, albeit entertaining, fashion. Teams of four to six drivers will race these rolling heaps of scrap for two days straight. The teams with cars that survive could win up to a few hundred dollars in nickels. It's the red-headed stepchild of auto racing, and it looks like a lot of fun. A completely inexperienced team of racers has accepted the challenge of building a race car from this clapped-out Toyota MR2 and racing it at the BFE GP in Denver, Colorado. The team consists of Joel Otto, team captain and the gnarliest fabricator. Tom Rose, the ultimate MacGyver who even tunes his espresso machine to perfection. Brett Foss, fencing contractor by day, by night he'll design the aesthetic of the car. Nathan Shooker, a guy who can weld stuff and will be behind the camera for much of this. Jan Otto, the team's experienced driver. He'll be showing the rest of the team the fastest lines around the track. And Les Spain, who will be in charge of communications when he's not driving. doing. <clears throat> Tearing a car apart like this is a lot of fun. A whole lot of fun. I mean, think back to when you were like 15 and all you could think about was racing stuff. And uh, That's a dense pack. Now it's actually going to happen. Try some road racing. Fire is the number one hazard in amateur auto racing. All of the cloth interior components will have to be removed in order to prevent the car from becoming a rolling death furnace, engulfing the driver in fire should the fuel system fail. Removing the interior and unnecessary systems, such as air conditioning, not only makes the car safer, but simplifies the repairs and modifications the team will need to make. When it's completely bare, the car weighs 500 pounds less than it did when the team purchased it. All that remains is the instrument cluster and pedal controls. Ever built a roll cage before? I never built a roll cage before. But this is professionally built roll cage. I just want to emphasize that because that's what the rules require. And then it'll, and then it'll curve around. No, that's the wrong one. With access to the relatively rust-free frame of the car, the next step is to install the roll cage. The specs for the cage are extremely detailed and must be followed to the letter. Any deviation or mistake could cause the team to fail tank construction and prevent them from racing. Mark, maybe further inside the mine. I'd take it off the ceiling. I think we'll go with 36. Building the cage is a time-consuming process, and even though Lemon's cars aren't going to be setting any speed records, the dangers of racing still exist, making it worthwhile to build the cage correctly. Good enough. The thing that just becomes more and more apparent as we're sitting here in the car looking at the roll cage pieces and trying to mount them in the right spot is the car keeps getting faster. Every piece you add, it gets a little bit faster. It looks a little more like a race car. It feels more like a race car. I actually hammered the floor to make the seat further to the right. It's just funny to think you can go sit in a very nice car like a Camaro or a Ferrari or something like that and you're like, oh, you know, this is a fast car. But you sit in a car like this and even though it's $500, it's the fastest thing I've ever been in. So it's 5.30 in the morning, and we figured out last night that we got a problem with the roll cage. Uh, you got to read the rules and read the rules and read the rules. And we thought, or at least I thought, I'm going to call this one my mistake, that what we were looking for was two inches of clearance from the 
roll cage to the helmet here on the side. And uh, there's a very clear diagram that says that the two inches that we are looking for is from the top of the roll cage to the top of the helmet. So this morning was spent cutting the roll cage out of the car that we had finished yesterday. We've only got a few weeks to go and uh, the list is two whiteboards long of things that have to get done on this car. Installing the cage incorrectly is a huge setback. With so little time left before the race, they are forced to work extra hours over the next couple days to rework the cage and get back on schedule. What type of person does it take to be a mechanic? <laughs> it takes somebody who is willing to put up with failure again and again and again. So if you spend a couple days on something and it doesn't work, you have to be willing to scrap it and start again. And scrap it and start again. So the type of personality it takes to do this kind of thing is somebody that's willing to innovate and somebody who's willing to um, give up when it doesn't work. Basically, somebody who's willing to keep going until you find something that works. What we have here, put on the little turntable, is this fine rod. It's $9.99. But you gotta call in the next five minutes and we'll throw in a second one for $5.99. You can't find this deal anywhere else, all right? See this thing? Look at that. Look at the way it just shines in the light. Who would not want this fantastic rod? Maybe we can turn a little faster, we'll create a little more interest. See how it walks? You can't, you can't buy that. Well, actually, you can buy that for $9.99. And if you call within the next five minutes, you get one for $5.99. That's two for, do the math, 15 bucks taking something or taking a bunch of random objects and turning it into something. That's something I've always been into since a kid. It just fits me. Classier too. Uh, so I gotta admit, I fell down. I. Um, I'm looking to see how to put this turbo on. I decided to have to put the turbo on before I run the coolant lines. And the turbo is kind of like this, man, we sure don't need to do it to run this car and it would create all kinds of problems because it's this junkyard turbo setup, but it just needs more power. I've got to put a turbo drain in the oil pan. I licked a couple places of doing it. If I do it on this side, there's already a drain, uh, drain back here for the oil cooler. Uh, I thought about putting it here, but anywhere on this side, it kind of gets in the way of the exhaust. That leaves either here or here. Take the pan off, drill a hole in it, Weld a fitting to the side of it, probably just a hose barb fitting. Slip a hose over it with a hose clamp. So, this used to go to the front of the car, and I yeah. ran it to itself. I mean, yeah. Does it get much easier? No. I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> You're right, it wants a turbo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for understanding. It wants a turbo really, really bad. <laughs> This is what I was expecting. We're just hoping the judges don't do as perfect to the turbo what you're doing. This is so sweet. Why would they do this? Because they might think that. We... I mean, this would be incredibly impolite. <laughs> I mean, this is like carnal knowledge of our turbo. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope they don't. I can't really think of a time when I wasn't taking something apart and putting it back together. That, that, and there's absolutely no possible way I could be an outfitter unless I was fixing my own mechanical stuff. You know. Plug in the headlamp switch, turn on the whoop de doo and see if we have any headlamps. Okay, good idea. Okay, so I'm thinking we have no headlamps. Well, we did have headlamps and we had a tachometer before. Well, now we have no headlamps. I can't remember which of them was driving, but they came up on a construction zone with a bunch of cars waiting at it, and they were fighting over this plate of falafel and who was going to get the last one, and they hit the ditch going too fast and upset the trailer and turtled it the welder was in it. I can't hear what Tom's saying, but it's probably not true. <laughs> For one. <laughs> All right, ready? I'm turning it on. Listen for sparks. Hold on a second, Griffin. Hear anything? Mm -mm. Me neither. I still don't hear anything. All right. 
With most of the modifications to the car complete and the electrical gremlins fixed, Joel starts the car for the first time. Amazingly, after being abandoned and sold for the price of scrap, the MR2 actually runs. So, are the brakes blend? Yep. I just gotta clean the back too, it was way too big to go from under. I see you put so plates to, on it. We need to bread the, yeah, we need to, we need to uh, bed the shoes, bed the pads. Oh, let's go do that. Each driver takes the car on a six mile round trip near the shop to get a feel for what they've built. Ooh, you can already tell it's lurking I in there. Know, I know. <laughs> we had boost. I felt that. It's right that. all over you. Oh, it has so much more power. So responsive. Like, you don't have to hit the gas pedal that much, and it just wants to take you somewhere. This car is really fun. It uh, it was slow before. Stock, it was slow. It's great. I'm just really happy. I can't believe that's the first run. The initial test drives exceed the team's expectations. All of the issues that need addressing are minor except for one. The discovery that three out of the four shocks are blown and leaking oil onto the brakes. Fixing the shocks is easy, but the lemon's rules state that the car can cost no more than $500. Purchasing new shocks will put the car over budget. We weren't cheating by putting this in here. We were, uh... Well, we had to wait for our budget to find out. Yeah, we were just, you know, overspending, but we were going to debt to put these in. And we were going to get out of debt by selling parts of the car. Part of Lemon's rules state that we can sell the parts that we remove from our car to offset the cost of building the car, which is... I mean, we pretty much need that to happen. We're, we'll be over budget if we don't sell at least something. Um, so I've been spending a bunch of time on the internet and eBay and taking pictures and boxing up stuff and sending them all over the world for five dollars. And spending a, a lot of time and not getting a lot of return. But it's either this or penalty lap, so we're doing the time and selling the parts. With only three days left before the race in Colorado, all the available team members spend all of their spare time to finish the car. Jan reinstalls the replaced struts. Tom finishes the last of the wiring. And Joel makes a blow-off valve for the turbo. We got a stiffer spring here. I'm going to try that. Yeah, you know, I calculated my crack pressure, given it's a 1 and 3 eighths uh, diameter. It's about 1 and a half square inches. Um, you know, given the 10 PSI I'm looking for. Stuff like this, I'm so glad he's here because I have no idea how all that would work. 2.03 <laughs> inches. Don't mind me, I'll be in the next room with my <laughs> cardboard sign. That's so precise. The final step is to make the MR2 appear as if it were actually fast. So this is our car, except ours is not red. And we want to achieve this. To achieve that. We have your standard pool noodle, sliced in half, to which I'm going to apply <laughs> double-sided tape and uh, stick on the side of the car. I'm sure Ferrari spent millions designing that. How much did we spend? We spent 75 cents. And I think we got a better product.
team secret arrives at High Plains Raceway as the gates open. It's cold and rainy. All the team members are new to racing and only one has any track experience at all. They need as much time on the track as possible, but the car is not cooperating. Stalling fits out here, so we're on, we'll probably come back in. Speed. Just, 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 go, just go faster, beat on it, drive around it. Joel and Tom suspect they're having fuel pressure problems. They rig up a remote fuel pressure gauge inside the car for Brett to monitor as a passenger. This? Yeah. It's a fuel pressure gauge. Checks fuel pressure. Fuel pressure. Uh, Brett had a reading as low as 10, right? Yeah, so um, there's a direct correlation between engine temperature, falling fuel pressure, and rising boost. And they're uh, <laughs> inversely proportional to what we actually desire. <laughs> uh, looks like Joel determined that it's the fuel pressure regulator. We're going to go over and ask the other MR2 teams and anybody else who runs this engine if they happen to have an extra. And Tom is on the phone with Napa trying to find one. Um, so someone's going to have to run into town if we can't get one here. That little, that little round thingy on the fuel rail? Yeah, I think we might have one of those with us. Team Secret learns early on that one of the things that makes Lemons unique is the willingness of other teams to help their competitors. Larry Sanders, captain of another sort of MR2 team, is kind enough to search his spare parts bin for a pressure regulator. That's all electrical. All right, I'm going to hand you guys some stuff. You look through these. If I'm not around and you guys need anything out yeah. of here, just, just help yourself. Help fine. yourself and just catch me later and let me know. Okay, awesome. Unable to find a pressure regulator that will work in the team's MR2, Joel will have to go to Denver to look for parts. But first, they'll put the car through tech inspection. Maybe Brett should do this. Yeah, Brett. What? You it just became the team rep. Yes. Yeah, I have to put the fuel pressure regulator back in. <laughs> Remember how you weren't mechanically inclined? Yep. No good deed goes unpunished. Do you two T's or one T? Two. So what's a rep do? Uh, you just fill out paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. Grease. So is our exhaust noise street legal or quieter? 92 dB. More nice and quiet. Well, since I did actually build some of the stuff on this car, but I'm was designated the guy that's signing off that it's done correctly. <laughs> making sure that it's done correctly, so I don't get tarred and feathered at the tech inspection. I already checked them all off and signed it, so I'm doing it in reverse order. I just blindly accepted the fact that Joel and Nate did it right. So. And now I'm just making sure I read it so that if I get asked any questions, I don't look like a fool. Rev it up to over 2,000 and kill, kill switch. All right, you're on fire. Get out. Get out. It's a Ferrari. It burns. You guys need to put cotter pins in your seatbelt latches. And what is that? What is that? Water injection for the turbo. Oh, okay. I don't think I've ever seen a turbocharged MR2 before. I won't see it for long because it'll hella blow up. <laughs> BS inspection is unique to Lemons races because the teams will have to justify the price of their car to a judge. This will be the team's toughest inspection because Joel is in Denver looking for parts and the rest of the team does not know where he got the car's signature turbocharger. So Tom okay, opens yeah. with bribes. Well, let's start with um, <laughs> worms. No, actually, this is only part of the preparation. I see. This is actually kind of horrible looking. <laughs> Try it. Gummy it's worms a, and chocolate? It's a dirt cup. And you know, if that doesn't work, I can resort down to homemade coffee balls. Cheesecake. I like cheesecake. And there's German chocolate cake. Oh, I like that. Uh-huh. How much do you like that? Uh, you like two? Sure. Oh, okay. 
here, actually, I'll let you guys do this. Open up the engine compartment. Oh, I was expecting to see like the, yes, I am seeing the turbo, okay. So this was never available, the factory turbo, as I recall. So where'd that come from? It was in a shed. Stage. So a car that actually might do okay, which this could, yeah. I care about the $500 budget, so do you have like a sheet? Good. Do you have like a summary sheet? Which oh, there we go. 300 bucks is scrap value. So you got it for scrap value. Well, it was pretty rusted, so it's not. A, it doesn't weigh that much. Where's the did you sell off anything from this car? Yes, we did. Is that even on here? Probably not. Okay, what'd you sell? We sold the radio trim, a couple inner pieces of the trim, the, the center console piece. I mean, I assume if they had a rodent problem, yeah. much of the interior was not. Actually, no, the interior was... The rodent problem was in the engine yeah, the compartment. Engine, the rodent problem was mostly right here in the electrical <coughs> wiring part. The turbocharger you got off some random assumption. <laughs> Oh, I don't know where you got that. I thought it was a, I thought it was a leftover I thought. I think it was a leftover Audi thing. Audi thing. Probably. Okay. It's, it's like 20 years it. old. He's I just see, waiting so for it. Who made the turbocharger? Who knows what it was? Oh, I mean, it says to do on there. Smith Salvin. So. <laughs> but you can look it up online. All right, you know what? I, I, I kind of, this is less cheated up than I've normally seen. So, and I'm. Oh, I'm, we made I'm halfway car. believing the plausibility of it. So, I'll, I'll give you zero laps. I'm going to be a class A. I mean, really, they just look at the high points. The turbo, red flag. But, you know, after being told that it had been found in a shed, found in a school bus, had been rusty, had been unrusty, and then Brett presented him with a receipt, you know, I think we could probably distract any tech inspector with the turbo, slip him some cheesecake, maybe a couple single bills, and have the uh, water pump camouflaged as a can of pass. <laughs> With the track closed for the night, Tom and Brett decide to pull the gas tank to look for anything else that might be causing their problems. I would say in the little sort of baffled container right there, there appears to be a quarter of a teaspoon. Oh, here's a, oh, oh, oh. Here's a ladle. Look at that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. See, this is a simulation of what's in that fuel tank. And now, what it really needs... With daylight quickly fading, Joel returns from Denver with a part that may get their car running again. This is a fuel pressure regulator that is not for our car, <laughs> but it might go to the fuel rail. If it goes on the fuel rail, which is underneath this thing, we got a new O-ring, which is good. We can just hook this thing up. Uh, this is the problem is the fitting down here. Uh, we don't have the fitting. Our fitting looks different. Anyway, I got a brake bleeder. That's not quite the right anything. So if I put this thing in a drill chuck like this, I can drill this thing out. It's, it's got a hole in the side, but I'd like to have a hole in the end. And this isn't really enough to clamp a hose onto. So I'll clamp these threads in my drill and then I'll either take a file or a uh, rotary tool, turn that thing down so it's long enough to slip a hose over and put a hose clamp on. We'll take the existing fuel line, we'll cut it off, uh, we'll extend it and we'll slip it on there. And then if it doesn't work, we can always put a splice in the uh, fuel line and run the old line. I, I think that will be, uh, I want to make sure it's totally safe because we don't want to have any fuel leaks. The next morning, the pits are busy with teams prepping their cars. With a track full of $500 cars pushed to their red line, any one of these teams could be packing it in early. Every team is doing everything they can to ensure each of their drivers get some seat time before that happens. Their work is only interrupted for the Lemons driver's meeting. You need a yellow wristband, driver's wristband on your left wrist. You need a sticker on the windshield of your car that says you passed tech. And you need a sticker on your helmet that says your gear is passed. We've got to be absolutely clear on this fuel thing, all right? We don't want fuel stacked out there. You bring it back to your paddock. When you know your car's coming in, you go out there, get your job done, bring it all back to where it goes. I don't want to 
I don't want hundreds of gallons of fuel stacked out here for hot cars coming in. <laughs> but you laugh, go out there and look right now. It's already there. And there's one can out there that doesn't have a lid on it that's got a rubber glove to block it. That made me really happy. And you guys, I mean, you guys think you can work the system? We've seen it all, all right? And then we get to black flags. Um, there's uh, the black stuff out there, and then there's the green and brown stuff, the grass. We're racing on the black stuff, okay? How do you feel about this morning? Yeah. It's nice sleep. Chances for the day. Oh, yeah. Somebody's biting your tail. It's just gentle. Team Secret is using all of their available time to finish the repairs they made last night. With no way to clean the gas tank at the track, they were forced to reinstall it and pin their hopes on a new fuel pressure regulator. Feeling nervous? Uh, not as much as you'd think, actually. Yeah? Because I really don't know how long I'm going to be out there. He's losing power around 4,000. He wasn't sure he could even make it in, but we've already, we've asked him. He's talked. He asked about the hot pits. We said no. Come all the way in. So he'll. Turn three or four. Just lost it. Just died. Didn't, didn't drive it at all. It almost stalled out that one up the hill. We tried disconnecting the uh, the vacuum slash boost line that went to the top of the pressure regulator. That didn't help. We uh, we put a copper splice into the return line and we crimped it so that it would uh, take the pressure from 47 to 50. So we're running set 50 psi uh, by crimping the return line. Uh, still working on it. There's something pretty funny about fixing something with a piece of copper tubing and a pair of pliers. Although, I want to point out that Joel has some really fancy pliers. <laughs> It's almost like an unsafe situation in some ways because you're inconsistent. Like you'll be blowing through some corners with some guys and all of a sudden just lose power. Yeah. Run good, but it still have these little hiccups. It's nothing you couldn't just work around. Yeah. And then it just lost it all completely. It's probably the worst that it ever did. Okay, try again. We're going to clean out the gas tank. So once the gas tank comes out, we're trying to find a pressure washer to hose out the inside and get all the junk loose. So the closest one we found is about a 45 minute drive from here. 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, plus about 20 minutes of cleaning. So we're, we're looking at three hours. Team Secret will have to wait for their gas tank to get back from Denver. But they aren't the only team having trouble with their car. There is a reason winning overall is not the highest honor at a lemons race. It's not uncommon for nearly half the cars entered not to finish. For most, it will be overheating problems. Some will lose CV shafts or wheel bearings, and there is always a car or two that literally spit their pistons from the block. For many of the crews, it's all they can do just to keep their cars on the track. It's like racing with a hand grenade after the pin's been pulled. It's just a matter of time before these crap cans start blowing up. None of these cars were designed for this, and no matter the level of engineering or trickery the teams employ will stop the fact that with only $500 to spend, none of these cars will ever be any good.
The fuel tank returns cleaned with only a couple hours left of racing. The team scrambles to modify their fuel pump and reinstall the tank. Some of their competitors are kind enough to help push the car to the fueling station. Enough of the other teams have had mechanical issues that if they can get some laps today and continue to run all day tomorrow, they will still be in the race. Team Victoria's Secret has spent over a month of work and thousands of dollars on safety equipment for their car. Their intermittent fueling problem has been preventing them from racing all weekend. Repair after repair and trying everything they could, this fix is all they have left. For the first time, the car is running like it should. Brett's lap times are becoming competitive and he begins to pass some of the other cars. If they can keep up this pace, they may still have a chance to fight their way back into the race. Or the car could start overheating and lose power again. But when life gives you a lemon, you weld in a roll cage, put on a fire suit, and race it till it breaks. Team Secret's race is effectively over. In true lemon style, they continue working on the car into the next day, grinding out three or four ridiculously slow laps at a time. Their only consolation is that the car never breaks down permanently and runs well enough to take the checkered flag in 39th position, 282 laps behind the leader. Yep, that tow truck's for me. I can't get it to run enough to get back to the pit safely. It's doing really well, and then it just died. And I couldn't get any revs, and I couldn't get any revs in any gear. Huh? You want me to back into the grass? I think you're okay just right here, because, you know, you're offline. Okay. You think it'll get going again or no? I don't know. It's been fuel problems the whole time. Yeah, I think I'm about to be towed less. It's not going. Okay. It would be highly embarrassing if I fracked the car. I feel a little impolite being out there. I mean, realistically, a car that's going this slow probably doesn't have any business being on a track. This, this is like musical chairs. We should have a prize for the, one of the six drivers, whichever one is driving when the car blows up permanently. I'm exempt. Did anybody see a parts store in town? We didn't see a town. There was no town. <laughs>